What was the design process like? How much did this cost? How does one get legal approval to launch one of these things? I'll be answering all of your frequently asked questions about my recent high altitude balloon launch in this video. I want to give you a basic overview of what happened. So I launched something known as a high altitude balloon, also referred to as HAB. Basically, I attached a payload with cameras to a balloon, which I filled with like a crap ton of helium, and just let it go. And it ascended into the atmosphere. And as it goes higher and higher into the atmosphere, the balloon itself gets bigger and bigger and bigger because the air inside the balloon wants to match the pressure of the air outside of the balloon. And as you go up in the atmosphere and altitude, that air becomes less dense, meaning the molecules become more spread out. And so the air inside the balloon is trying to spread out, uh, but it can only do that so much. So at a certain point in its ascent, the balloon pops. Now once that happens, a parachute deploys and the payload comes gliding back down to the ground. I have GPS on board the payload and this is essential because the only way for me to get the video of the experience is to retrieve those cameras to get the SD cards in those cameras. So after it pops and it's falling down toward the ground, I'm tracking where it's going on uh, on the GPS. I have a GPS app on my phone that it's sending coordinates to. And so we go and find the payload, which ends up being a couple of hours away from the launch site. And that's how uh, I got the video of the launch. My entire launch lasted about two hours from launch to landing. It reached its peak altitude after about 90 minutes, meaning it only took 30 minutes to come back down toward the ground. And it ended up about 90 to 100 miles away from the launch site. I asked you on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram if you had any questions about uh, this project, and you did. <laughs> and so I'm gonna answer six of the most commonly asked questions that you guys asked. First question. How high did my balloon get? And what do I mean by edge of space? So I say edge of space because balloons can't actually go to space. If someone sent something up on a balloon and they told you that it went to space, they're lying to you. <laughs> the line of space is around 50 miles or 62 miles for you Von Kerman purists. That's at 327,000 feet. High altitude balloons usually barely get to 100,000 feet. So about one third the way to what people consider space. So it's not space, but it's in the stratosphere, so people call it the edge of space. It's tricky though, because it kind of looks like space. And that's because the cameras that are typically used on balloons, these GoPros or knockoff GoPros, have a fisheye effect and it distorts the edges of the image. And so it looks like you're seeing the curvature of the earth, uh, but you're not, it's sort of a trick of the eye. You can't actually see the curvature of the earth at that height, it's just not as pronounced. But anyway, based on the size of my balloon, the weight of my payload, and the amount of helium I put in the balloon, the entire system was designed to go to about 100,000 feet. But it popped early, it popped at about 56,000 feet, and I'm not entirely sure why. I will take your theories. Um, but it looks like when I was filling up the balloon, you could see that the balloon itself was a little lopsided. I haven't quite seen a balloon look like that before. So there might be some manufacturing error with the balloon. Also, we weren't wearing gloves when we were handling the balloon. Some people say that the oils on your hands could affect the latex and the balloon. But I've also read that that doesn't matter. And then when you add gloves, then you're adding sort of an extra risk factor of maybe losing the balloon as you're trying to fill it up because it's sort of clumsy to deal with the balloon with gloves. So we decided not to wear gloves and maybe that had a difference. I don't know. But either way, I wasn't too mad about it because the view at 56,000 feet was pretty spectacular. And because it popped so early, it didn't go as far and we didn't have to drive as far to retrieve it, which cut like a few hours off of the chase and retrieve time, which I wasn't super mad about. 
The second question that I got a lot is how much did this cost and what did I need to build it? So if you go to the original video and look at the description, I put a checklist of everything that I needed to create this project and how much it cost and where you can buy it. Total for me, this project was about a thousand dollars. Now I saved a lot of money by using knockoff GoPros. Uh, and I did that because I was only like 70% sure that I was going to find my payload in the end. And I didn't want to buy three $400 GoPros on a project that I may or may not lose. And so I actually found some knockoff GoPros on Amazon that were 30 bucks that worked pretty well. So if you look at other HAB videos online, they'll probably look a bit more spectacular than mine because they're using legit cameras. Um, but my cameras, they worked well for, for this particular project. The biggest cost items were the balloon. The balloon itself was 120 bucks and I had to buy, well, I, I bought two, one as a backup just in case. Um, and then the helium. The helium was, I think, $340 for a 300 cubic foot tank of helium. And that was incredibly hard to get. Um, for a number of complex reasons, helium is in super high demand right now and kind of hard to find. I went to about five or six gas suppliers in my area and they did not want to give me helium because they already have clients that they're trying to make sure that they get the helium that they need. And so I had to beg, barter, and plead, and I had to go and tell them that, you know, I was pregnant and this was my announcement and I rubbed my belly like a genie lamp and luckily someone took pity on me <laughs> and uh, finally gave me helium. But I would say the biggest bottleneck to doing this project again for fun would probably be the helium, just because I don't wanna have to go through that process again. Third question was, what was the design process like and how would you actually go about building one of these things yourself? Now, I would say there are five major phases of building a high altitude balloon. Design, build, test, launch, and then chase and retrieve. I had been to a couple of launches of high altitude balloons in the past, so I was sort of familiar with what that looked like not super familiar with how to design and build one myself. So that's where I spent the vast majority of my time. I would say I spent two months designing this and about maybe three weeks building it. Uh, but yeah, it took me about two and a half months to create this project. Because I had never built one of these things before, the first thing that I did was Google, like how does one build a high altitude balloon? And the problem with that is that there is no one tutorial online to teach you. There are about a thousand of them and they all build these balloons very differently. That is probably the biggest challenge of doing something like this because you're not really sure where to start. But I would say there are six major components of a high altitude balloon. You have your balloon, the gas to fill your balloon, your parachute, the radar reflector, the cord that connects all of that, and your payload. You can customize each of those components. So there are balloons that come in different sizes that will determine how high your balloon goes and ultimately how long your flight is. You can choose different size parachutes that will determine how fast or slow your payload descends to the ground. With the gas to fill your balloon, people typically choose between hydrogen and helium. Most people choose helium because it's less flammable and so it's safer. That is definitely what I did. Um, I would say the two things that don't really change your project all that much are the cord and the radar reflector. The most customization that will happen will be around your payload. Most payloads will have three major things. They'll have a GPS on board or multiple GPSs on board. They'll have a flight computer. That's where you're doing your experiment or taking your data. And they'll have cameras to capture the entire experience. With your GPS, you mostly have three options. One that works primarily and exclusively over satellites, one that works over radio towers, and one that works over cell towers. Now, the satellite one is the, the major one that people use is the Spot GPS systems. I use Spot Gen 3. Um, this is a really good dummy-proof handheld device that you can throw in your payload. The only challenge with this one is it needs the line of sight to communicate with satellites. So you need to make sure that if your payload lands upside down, somehow your spot GPS will still be looking at the sky. 
The second one is the radio system one. So this is known as APRS, Automatic Packet Reporting Systems. This is the one that you need your amateur radio license or your ham radio license to do. I actually have my ham radio license, uh, but this is the most complex of the three. And so I tried to, to code up an APRS system over an Arduino Uno. And for the life of me, I just could not get my code to work. And after two weeks of working on this, I just, I just scrapped the project because I, I didn't need it. Um, there were other GPS systems that I could use. And so maybe in the future, I'll try that one again, uh, but that is definitely the most complex of the three. The third option is a cell service based GPS system. Now the FAA has some pretty strict requirements on whether or not you're allowed to use these on high altitude balloons, which you should definitely look into. And I will plead the fifth on whether or not I included one of these in mine, but is there a really cheap, small, light, discrete cell service based GPS system on Amazon that's primarily used for catching cheating spouses that also works really well with balloons? Who's to say? With the cameras, you have a lot of options out there. Most people decide between GoPros or knockoff GoPros. I chose knockoff GoPros because I wasn't about to lose $1,200 worth of cameras because I didn't know what I was doing. The last thing that you can customize is the flight computer. This is where you're going to take all of your experiment data throughout your flight. For me, I coded up an Arduino Uno that was um, combined with a basic sensor set that had altitude, temperature, and pressure. And then I also included an SD card on the Arduino so that it could write all of the data of the altitude, temperature, and pressure to the SD card throughout the flight. And then after the flight, I just popped in the SD card and I had all of that information throughout the flight. So that's how I know that it reached 56,000 feet. Um, the pressure also matches uh, the altitude of the outside at 56,000 feet. My temperature was a little wonky because I didn't actually put the temperature sensor outside my payload. Outside the payload, it was probably around negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit because my sensor was kept inside my payload and I had like 15 hand warmers inside my payload. It never got colder than about 50 degrees inside the payload box, which is good because I need to keep all the cameras and batteries and everything warm. Fourth question is, did I know ahead of time where the balloon was going to land? The answer is kind of. There are flight predictions that you can run online where you input your balloon size, your payload weight, how much helium you plan to put in the balloon, your launch coordinates, and the time and day of your launch. And it'll tell you where it is probably going to go, where it's going to pop, and where it's likely going to land. I ran these predictions multiple times leading up to the launch, and it was different every day based on the weather prediction for the day of my launch, but it was in generally the same type of flight path, meaning it was going to go south, and I knew it was going to go east. And I knew it was going to go east because uh, on Earth we have the jet stream, which is between about 25,000 and 65,000 feet, and that moves from west to east. These are really fast moving winds from west to east. And you could probably intuitively know this because if you've ever flown cross country in a plane, any flight going from west to east is always going to be faster than when you're going from east to west because you have your wind, you have the wind at your back when you're going from west to east. So basically I kind of knew where it was going to go. I knew that as soon as we launched, we, we needed to start driving south and we needed to start driving a little bit east, but it wasn't until I got those GPS signals that I knew exactly where it was. And so I probably had maybe like a 20 mile radius that was fairly accurate. Uh, and then we just had to fine tune where we were driving based on those GPS coordinates. Question five. How heavy was my payload? All in all, uh, my payload was about seven or eight pounds. I really wanted to keep it fairly light so that it could go as high as possible with the balloon and helium that I was using. And the last question was, how does one get legal approval to launch one of these things? I also found this super interesting. And surprisingly, it is very easy for anyone to get approval to launch one of these things from the FAA, as long as you know what you're doing. 
Essentially 24 to 48 hours before you launch, you have to call the FAA and file a NOTAM, which stands for Notice to Airmen for a High Altitude Balloon Release. And when you call the FAA, there's a specific number you're supposed to call. Uh, there's gonna be someone that answers and they're gonna ask you a series of questions. You know, what state you're launching from, the latitude longitude of your launch, the day and time of your launch, the flight prediction that you ran before, if they're gonna ask you, you know, what direction the balloon is flying in, how far away from major airports you're launching from, how long your flight time is going to be, and where you expect it to land. And after you give them all of that information, uh, which you should prepare ahead of time, after you do all of that, they'll give you a NOTAM number, which is essentially your permit to fly. And I didn't get any further questions after I had given them all that information. They were just like, here's your NOTAM number, have fun. And I was like, that's it? That's all I need to do? <laughs> so yeah, it is fairly easy to get approval from the FAA if you wanna launch one of these things yourself. And that about covers it. If there's anything else you wanna know about my high altitude balloon, just ask your questions in the comments and I will be sure to answer them to the best of my ability as someone who has successfully launched one of these things to the edge of space. But again, thank you all so much for your congratulations. We are very excited over here. And yeah, let me know if you wanna know anything else. Bye.